In this online lecture, we're going to discuss the concept of dipole moment and how to determine if a molecule has a dipole moment. And our key point for this particular lecture, what we're going to see is that to have no dipole moment, a molecule must either one, have no polar bonds, or two, have electron polarity vectors that cancel out. Now, let's explain this. Remember, we learned in general chemistry the trend of electronegativity, and that is simply it increases as you move up and to the right on the periodic table of elements. So, for example, does this following molecule have a dipole moment? Well, according to the electronegativity trend, Cl would be more electronegative than hydrogen. So he would be partially negative, we would say, and the hydrogen, therefore, partially positive. Now, that's one way to represent the relative charges on this molecule. However, we're going to need to understand another way, and that is to represent this particular truth as what's called an electron polarity vector. What this arrow does is simply point in the direction that electrons would want to move within the molecule. And notice the arrow is pointing to the Cl, because electrons, of course, want to move to the more electronegative atom. Now, this is a vector, and if you remember, vectors have magnitude and direction. So the length of this vector would represent how strongly the electrons want to move from the hydrogen to the chlorine. So our analysis for this particular molecule, we would say, number one, that the molecule is polar, or we can say the molecule is a dipole or has a dipole moment. So basically, a dipole is when a molecule has two different poles or ends, with one end being partially positive and the other one being partially negative. To master organic chemistry, we have to be able to do this type of analysis on many molecules we encounter. We're going to see that this helps us determine how a molecule might behave in a reaction. Now, there's one more thing I want to talk about here, is that you can actually quantify a dipole moment, which means you could put a number on it. And the way it works is that it follows this equation you see right here. Dipole moment is equal to E times D. E is simply the charge on each atom in the bond, and D is the length of the bond. When you apply this formula to a bond and calculate its dipole moment, this formula spits out the units of dipole moment as simply something called a Debye, which is usually denoted by a capital D. We'll talk about this formula in more depth in another online lecture. All I want you to know now is that a formula does exist, which means this gives us a more accurate comparison of two bonds in terms of polarity. For instance, if you apply this equation to, let's say, these bonds right here, these are the Debye's that you would get for each bond. Notice the HC bond is 0.4 Debye's. The HCl bond is 1.1 Debye, and so on. So this is a more accurate way to measure how much more polar a bond is than another. So let's make sure you got this. Let's look at another example here. Now, watch in this example how hybridization comes into the picture and how we need it to get to the answer. And again, what we're trying to determine for this molecule, is this molecule polar or does it have a dipole moment? And watch how I use all the previous skills we learned in other online lectures to get to this particular answer. What I'm going to do with is start with the Lewis dot structure. So you would have to know how to draw the Lewis dot structure of a molecule first. Then what we would do is let's determine if there's hybridization on this central oxygen. If we use the quick and dirty method that we talked about before in another online lecture, we'll see that this oxygen has a total steric number of four, which means his hybridization is sb3 hybridized. Now, we don't need to look at the actual orbitals. We just determine the hybridization to simply get the bond angles. And remember, for water, the bond angles would be slightly less than 109.5 due to those lone pair electrons, which means water's true geometry looks like this. In other words, water is V-shaped or bent. In this case, I'm using Vesper theory to help me. Now let's do our dipole analysis. 
and let's look at each bond separately. Let's look at the right OH bond. Who's more electronegative, oxygen or hydrogen? Clearly oxygen is, so our electron polarity vector would point towards the oxygen. And let's call this vector 1. The other OH bond on the left has the same thing. The O is of course more electronegative than the hydrogen. Let's call that polarity vector 2. Now to determine the overall direction of electron movement, we would have to add vector 1 and vector 2. And if you take in physics, you might remember how to do this. If not, it's very simple. All you do is take one vector, let's say this first vector, and orient the other vector's tail to his head, like this. This was called the tail-to-head method in adding vectors. Again, we're putting the tail of vector 2 to the head of vector 1. And we're preserving the directions that they're pointing. Once we have this, we now add the vectors by drawing a line from the tail of the first vector to the head of the second vector. That would look like this. This is the overall net direction of electron movement. That means overall electrons want to move this way on this molecule towards the oxygen, which should make sense. Because we have a net electron movement, that means that this molecule is polar and it possesses a dipole moment. So there it is. Notice all these skills coming together. Lewis dot structure, hybridization, bond angles, polarity. Notice how we're piling concepts on top of concepts to get to answers. As you progress through organic chemistry, that concept pile is only going to get higher. But don't worry, remember our goal is to master organic chemistry, so I will walk you through each concept and show you how to stack them along the way. So let's look at another example here. Is this following molecule polar? Well, generating his Lewis dot structure, we would end up with this right here. And to get bond angles, we might want to think of hybridization. That central carbon has a steric number of 4, which means he's sp3 hybridized. The bond angles, therefore, are 109.5, which means this is his actual three-dimensionality arrangement here. However, we talked about before in a previous online lecture that carbon and hydrogen are roughly the same in electronegativity, which means none of the bonds in this molecule are polar, and therefore there's no electron polarity vectors to draw. So therefore, overall, this molecule is nonpolar and has no dipole moment. Now, let's pause for a second here. Why is this skill so important in organic chemistry? Well, remember, there's a famous saying that like dissolves like, meaning this. Let's say you want to react this molecule. We learned in general chemistry that typically reactions take place in solvents. So if we want to react this molecule, we'd have to place him in a solvent that's similar or like him. In other words, a nonpolar solvent. So the ability to just look at a structure and determine polarity is going to help us pick out the appropriate solvent for a particular reagent. So let's look at another example here. Does CO2 have a dipole moment? Well, first we would draw his Lewis dot structure. It looks like this. But careful, remember, just because this is the Lewis dot structure doesn't mean that this is his actual three-dimensional geometry. To figure out actual geometry, we need hybridization. What is the hybridization of that carbon? Well, he has two double bonds, giving him a total steric value of 2, which means he's sp hybridized. That in turn means that his bond angles are 180 degrees. So this ends up being the actual geometry of this molecule. The CO bonds are 180 degrees apart. Now we can look at the electron polarity vectors. According to the trend, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So the bond on the left would have this vector. And the bond on the right would have this particular vector. Now here's what the hybridization is telling us, is that these two vectors point exactly in the opposite direction of each other. And think about their relative magnitudes. Each vector represents a CO bond. 
So these vectors would be equal in magnitude. That means two vectors equal in magnitude that point in opposite directions, if you were to align these vectors tail to head, they would simply cancel each other out. Which means CO2 is a nonpolar molecule, or in other words, has no dipole moment. Notice what's happening here. We have a molecule that happens to have polar bonds, but is yet overall nonpolar simply because the polar bonds cancel each other out. So if we wanted to react CO2, the appropriate solvent would be a nonpolar solvent. Now let's look at an organic chemistry example. Look at this organic molecule. This happens to be its Lewis dot structure. And this also happens to be the correct geometry, which I'll prove in a few minutes. But first, let's pay attention to the electron polarity vectors. Remember, CH bonds are nonpolar, but the carbon bonded to the CL would be a polar bond. And since CL is more electronegative than carbon, this would be the electron vector for this bond. The other C-CL bond in the lower left would have this direction. And again, these two vectors would have equal magnitudes because they represent the same two atoms within the bond. Now, to prove that this is the actual geometry of this molecule, all I have to do is first pay attention to the hybridization. Determining that, we would see that the two carbons here are sp2 hybridized, which means the bond angles are 120 degrees. And if you look at our molecule, all the bond angles around those two doubly bonded carbons are roughly 120 degrees, which means this. Let's get an isolated view of our polar bonds here. Remember, because the carbon is sp2 hybridized, we're saying that this bond angle right here happens to be 120. And since all of them are 120, we would say so is this bond angle right here. If that's the case, then notice how these electron vectors would be arranged to each other. They'd both be pointing in these respective directions. Which means when you go to add these two vectors, Notice the same kind of thing happens that we saw with CO2. These vectors point in the exact opposite direction and are the same magnitude. So since they cancel each other out, overall we would say this molecule is nonpolar and doesn't have a dipole moment. So notice on your organic chemistry test, if your professor asks you whether or not a molecule has a dipole moment, you would have to go through these steps to get to the answer. Notice this is what I mean by when you take organic chemistry in order to do well, it's kind of like a math class and a philosophy class. Think about that analogy here. In order to get to this answer, what we're doing is going through a series of steps to get to the answer, kind of like going through a series of algebraic steps to get to an answer. Which means if you just memorize every fact in your organic chemistry textbook, you're not going to answer questions like this correctly. Just like if you memorized your algebra textbook, you wouldn't get any problems right on the test. You simply don't know how to solve for x. Remember, because organic chemistry happens to have a lot of facts, a lot of students treat it as kind of like a philosophy course where you memorize a bunch of facts and not need to do any problems. But like we said before, organic chemistry is like a philosophy class and a math class. You do have to treat it like philosophy in terms of understanding all the facts and getting them down, and then you also treat it like a math class, which means you do practice problems. So here are key points here. We just saw to have no dipole moment, a molecule must either one, have no polar bonds, or two, have electron polarity vectors that cancel out.